independence and that's uh, to do with the uh, relatives of people who were killed in the um, in, uh, from 1916 up to the time of the Civil War, 1923. Um, and he'd be dealing particularly with uh, dealings with the department and trying to get pension, etc. Out, out of the government. So uh, without further ado, I'll leave things in a moment. to speak here this evening. Um, of course, everyone's very welcome. Thanks for turning out. Can you, you hear me okay? Not really. Not really. Can you move closer to the little bit? No, it's not working. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll try and speak up. So, as has already been said, the title of the, today's talk is Independence and Dependence in the Military Service Pensions Collection. So just a bit about the Military Service Pensions Collection before I get into the details of today's talk. The collection, the work on the project began in 2008 and scheduled to continue until 2023. So here we have two rows of unprocessed uh, boxes, which contains about 240 boxes. And the Pensions Collection contains anywhere between 270,000 and 300,000 files. And these then relate to up to 80,000 individuals. So to date, we've had five releases from the collection, and we have released files of 8,000 applicants. As well as this then, there's been a release from the medal series, which is sort of a standalone series, and that refers to another 44,000 applicants. So a couple of in these, five releases to date. There's also the membership roles of the IRA, Coming to Man, the FINA Iron, and the Irish Citizen Army. And then there is also the supporting materials, the departmental files that go along with the series. So as you can see in the last four years there's already massive amounts of material that are available for research. The pensions machine was created essentially under two strands of legislation, they being, first of all, the Army Pensions Act, which was introduced in 1923, and then the Military Service Pensions Acts, which were introduced in 1924. And these are varied, varying forms of this legislation continues until the 1950s. The legislation was introduced to make allowances and gratuities available to those members who were wounded in the period 16 to 23, or those dependents of those people who were killed in, in that same period. And then finally, the Pensions Acts made pensions payable to veterans of 16 to 23 period. While there are many strands of history, all styles of history covered within the collection, today I'm just going to focus on the social aspects and social history. And this is largely going to be on the dependence of the fatalities. Now, I'm only going to refer to maybe seven or eight cases throughout the talk, but this is yet just a few of the thousands that are already available and the thousands more that are going to come out over the next couple of years. So just before um, today, when I was putting this together, sorry, yesterday when I was putting this together, I won't seem too much. Um, the, I just did a search on our live system on the database, just typed in local addresses to see what would, what would return. So for example, you can see there, Tala has 58 results, Kundalk in 74 and so on. Now these results are 
they're coming about because it's any time someone mentions that it gives that as an address. So any veteran that gives that an address. And they date from 1923 all the way up to 2016. So that's anyone who lived in Tala or anything like that between those dates. And that's what we have the results so far. And as of course, as we go on, this is going to, you know, this will increase. Here we have, um, it's an extract from the membership rolls, and it's for Tala Company in July 1922. Now, the membership rolls, they were, they were gathered in the mid-1930s. So following the introduction of the Pensions Act of 1934, the department and the pensions board were so overwhelmed by the amount of applicants under the 34 Act, for example, there's 66,000 applicants alone. So as you can imagine, the whole process, people are overwhelmed with the pure numbers. So they set out, they sent out to the old brigade and old commanding officers to supply names of members who were in their organization or in their companies in 1921 and 1922. So this example here is from Tala, which was referred to as A Company. Third Battalion, Two Dublin Brigade. Just then, again, a search on activities that took place in the locality. So first of all, we have the attack on British forces at the Red Cow, and this occurred in May 1921. And it's when a party of RAF personnel are returning to their uh, camp at Baldono. They're attacked by a number of IRA. So far, we found 25 different references to people taking part in this event. And by taking part, I mean actually at the engagement, or simply doing scouting work, or reporting on patrols and movements of the RAF. The second reference then refers to burning of military lorries at Fox and Geese, which is also just around the Red Cow, I believe. Uh, thirdly, then, there was references to raids for petrol tins on Tala camp. Then during the truce period, the IRA has established a training camp in Tala. And there's also another example then of references to attacks on Baldonnell Aerodrome. They occurred in 1919 and 1922. So they're just some of the overall activities. So then getting in more into the individuals reference for the area. First of all, you have got IRA Private John Monks. Now, he's killed at the, at the Red Cow on the 28th of June, so he's probably one of the earliest um, Civil War fatalities, given the official date of the 28th of June. Then moving on to the 6th and 7th of October, you've got the deaths of Eamon Hughes, Brendan Hoolan, and Joseph Rogers. Now, their bodies were found again at the Red Cow uh, on the 7th, and it's reported that they were taken in for questioning by members of the National Army the day before on the 6th, and then their bodies were discovered the um, mm -hmm. following day. Mm -hmm. So you can see there, I put beside Joseph Rogers, no file found. So that basically means to date we haven't got a file for him, or his, uh, his dependents never made a claim. Maybe there was no one to make a claim for him. And then finally, the example is National Army Sergeant John Devoy. John Devoy was killed in Main Street in Clondalkin in November 1922. So there's just some of the examples of what turns up in terms of the veterans living in the locality and then some of the activities that are going on in the War of Independence and Civil War in the area as well. Now turning to the main focus of the presentation, it's going to focus primarily on the Army Pensions Acts, and they are in various guises from 1923 to the 1950s. Basically, there was four primary qualifying criteria for someone to be made an award under the Army Pensions Act. The person had to be on active service in one of the recognised organisations. They had to have been killed or wounded in the course of their duties. There was not to be any serious negligence or misconduct on their part, and then finally they had to be obeying a lawful order. So I've basically taken examples to 
prove all these were cases where these things weren't met. So that's what a lot of the examples would focus on. So then you've also got supporting files that go along with the main application file. And an individual can have up to 10 files. The majority have um, three, but you can't have up to 10. So if the claim is successful, you're going to have a payment file to go with it. There's also files then for these other schemes, the Criminal Injuries Ireland Act 1919 and 1920, and the Compensation Personal Injuries Committee. And these made awards available to individuals wounded or killed up to May 1923. There's also files then relating to the Army Pensions Board, the APB, and the Military Service Registration Board, MSRB. So basically the, A, the APB and the MSRB, they carry investigations, either medical or on the, the military background or qualifications of, of, the, of the deceased member. So here I have an example of the hierarchy of victimhood, if we want to call it that. So on the left-hand side, you've got the awards that were made available under the Pension Act 1923. So this is the Covenant Gale government. And then the Army Pension Act 1932, following the introduction of the Fianna Fáil government. So basically, they've identified officer and soldier. And you can see, basically, the dependence of an officer got twice as much as the dependence of a soldier. There's also then, at, lastly, on the last Collier Bureau, you have, there were special circumstances, um, or necessitous circumstances, and this would be a one-off gratuity and that would range up to either 150 or 100 pounds. Then the 1932 Act, on the right-hand side, there's no differentiation between rank. Everyone gets um, the same amount. What's the remarriage gratuity? <laughs> oh yeah, so if, uh, if a widow, if she's successful, she's given a widow's allowance, and that's stipulated. That's only during widowhood. So if she remarries, then that allowance stops, but she's given a one-off payment oh. as a remarriage gratuity. Okay, so I go to have have a quick look at this and here we have a record of all the fatalities that were recorded in the collection to date between 1916 and 1924. Now this is not a figure of all fatalities for the period, it's just the ones that we found to date in the last 10, 10 years. And this includes 1916, War of Independence and Civil War. It also includes those who were both successful and unsuccessful as well as civilians, because there was nothing to stop civilians applying um, the case that it would be unsuccessful, but everyone who has made an application. So while this is just statistical at the moment, it does show um, how, as the work progresses, it'd be useful to get some sort of actual figures for the, the War of Independence and the Civil War fatalities. <coughs> One of the options then that's also available is that we can break down this information um, in much more detail. So here, for example, I've taken out the IRA Civil War. So these are IRA anti-treaty Civil War fatalities. So you've got the months on the bottom and then on the side, the scale. So you can see then as well that it starts in April 1922 rather than June and then continues out till June 1923. So obviously with the initial outbreaking, you've got uh, 38. Uh, then the figure generally tails off until the policy of execution is introduced towards the end of 
1922, you get a spike in that figure, and then the number generally tails off again. And that is until March 1923. And that's for, again, for, um, executions, but also of as a result of incidents in Kerry, where there was a large number of IRA men killed in March. And again, the figure tails off. I've also done the same then for balance for the National Army fatalities for the same periods. So again, their deaths are recorded as early as March 1922. And they're included on the graph because they were recognized by the Department of Defense and there were major allowances. The real, I suppose, the more surprising figure is that the amount of National Army fatalities for June, July and August as compared to the previous life of the IRA. Um, again, it, it, the graph follows the general trend where it's, it peaks and then sharply <coughs> tails off. There's again another spike in March 1923, and again this is in some parts related to events in Kerry again. And then the figure generally tails off again. Now, as you can imagine, with the outbreak of the Civil War, there is mass amounts of confusion throughout the country. There's the lack of communications and the general disorder. And this all means that information travels quite slowly. So here we have a letter to the father of Patrick Hogan. And Patrick had been sentenced to death by the military court for being in possession of firearms in County Wexford on the 15th of February 1923. So this letter dated the 13th of March 1923 is very likely the first information that his father, uh, that the father had received that his son had been killed it was the letter that had been written out to him that morning. So this means obviously that there's no chance for the family to have a last meeting or to say goodbye or anything like that. It's all very matter of fact. So another example of the confusion um, is that of Thomas Murray. Now Thomas joins the National Army but deserts in August 1922 and rejoins the IRA. So he's then arrested by the National Army, court-martialed for illegal possession of a weapon and executed in January 1923 in Dundalk. So all the while, the army authorities had continued to pay his mother a dependence allowance. This was sort of a, a weekly or monthly allowance that would be paid to the mothers or the, the families um, while their sons were serving in the army. So basically, the situation only comes to light uh, when the mother writes in saying that she hasn't heard from her son for six, seven months that they actually discover he's deserted, rejoined, been executed, all while they're continuing to pay. So that just shows the the lack of communication, the general disorder. So I'm going to move now to some of the individual stories that have come to light over the last number of years. So the first is that of Jeremiah Matney. Jeremiah is killed on the 5th of January 1923 at Mill Street in County Cork. Matney is a former member of the British Army, which he left um, in September 1919. Now we have two files, sorry, two letters on file from his widow. I'll just read out the relevant, the relevant pieces. His widow's name is Margaret, and she is pleading with the department to issue her with an award. She writes, "I am actually starving. I have had no food for a week." I have every bit of clothes sold to get a bit of food for the children. And then on the 4th of June 1924 she writes, What in the name of God am I going to do? I am here among strangers without a bite to eat. I feel like committing suicide this morning, listening to the three little orphans crying with the hunger. So in 1924 then, I think it's a couple of weeks after these letters, she's actually awarded a widow's allowance and then an allowance for each of her three children. I'm going to have a look at the 
as I already mentioned, the negligence or misconduct was one way in which you would be excluded from the maiden award. So the first example of that is Sergeant James Conway, and he's accidentally shot and killed at his home in Clancy Street, Formoy, on the 8th of May, 1923. It's an unsuccessful claim by his widow, and she writes in, sorry, your name is uh, Nelly. She writes in saying, I was playing with a revolver, the property of my husband, who was at the time of the room with me. I pointed the revolver at him for a joke and pulled the trigger. The bullet struck him in the face and killed him. Now, the investigations revealed that orders had been published directing that all small arms would be handed into stores. So, basically, Jeremiah, um, James Conway was in possession of a revolver without authority. So the Army Pensions Board therefore found that no award could be made as there was serious negligence and misconduct on his part. Um, the other two facts related to this are that they had only been married for three weeks at the time of the incident and that she was, um, Nelly was absolved or um, there was no blame placed on her part. So the second example of negligence misconduct refers to Privates Michael Kenny and Thomas Moore. Now they're drowned on the 18th of September 1923 um, in Mallow. Again, it's unsuccessful application by their dependents. And the reason it's unsuccessful is Privates Kenny and Moore <laughs> spent the night in Mrs. Daly's Watertown. <laughs> a house of alleged disrepute. This house was at the time out of bounds to all troops. Both men left the house at 4am and in order to avoid going through the town of Mallow, attempted to cross Blackwater in a small boat used by workmen on the Mallow viaduct. This boat was found bottom upwards some hours later and a search was then made for the bodies of the two soldiers. So again it's found by the Army Pensions Board that both were killed they weren't killed in the course of their duty or an act, while on active service, <laughs> and that uh, their deaths were directly <laughs> attributable to their own serious negligence and misconduct. Maybe it was just a shabby. Um, one of the other areas in which an application could be rejected was that of legitimacy. So here we have um, the example of Thomas Greedy. So he's killed in Tallow, County Waterford on the 10th of March, 1923, by a trip mine. His oh, the Bridget um, Greedy's dependence application was rejected um, as she was not eligible to receive an award under the Army Pensions Act. And you can see there it says that uh, in respect of the death of her illegitimate child, consequently ineligible. Oh, So I'm going to move now towards some more of the stories. And the first example of that is Seamus Devon and the Devon's family. Now, they would have appeared to have been comfortable in early 1920s Ireland. Seamus was a farmer and he was also a Sinn Féin TD from the second and third dolls. His wife, Mary Ellen, was a national school teacher and the couple had married on Easter Monday 1916 in Sligo. In 1918, they had a son, Patrick. Now, Seamus fought in the War of Independence <coughs> and at the outbreak of the Civil War opted to fight with the IRA on the anti-treaty anti -treaty side. So, following the outbreak of the Civil War, their, their lives are going to trade dramatically. So, Devons is killed on Mount ben Benbulban on the 20th of September, 1922. Some say that he was killed, he was among a few killed that there were prisoners of the National Army or others say that was a, during an attack by the National Army on, on a camp that the IRA had. So he leaves behind his widow and a five year old and Patrick who's just five years old. So the far reaching consequences then of Seamus' death is illustrated 
in his file. So this death cert here shows that on the 16th of October 1936, his wife, Mary Ellen, age 52, commits suicide. Mm. The cause of her death is certified as Lysol po poisoning, which she drank deliberately while suffering mental depression. So according to information in the file, she had been, been unwell for some time previously. And then when the family were going through her papers, they found that there's a number of uncashed warrants for her widow's allowance, and that she hadn't actually cashed those. So as a result of her death, Patrick, <coughs> who's only 18 then, comes under the care of his paternal uncle. So while the family in 1920 may have seemed fairly comfortable and well off, it just shows that in the 14 years how the Devon family was being, had been completely devastated. And just by way of information that um, James Devon's grandson, Jimmy Devon, served as a TD for Fianna Fáil for the Sligo North Leitrim between 2002 and 2011. I next want to talk about two cases which demonstrate the bureaucracy of the, that the dependents had to deal with. The first example is that of William O'Riordan. William was killed in County Limerick in May 1921. He was a member of um, a flying column which were surprised by a party of um, the Yorkshire Regiment and members of Black and Tans and there was a few others killed in this incident as well. So, William's father, James, made an application in 1924. William had previously attended the Albert Agricultural College in, uh, in Dublin and was due to take up a position with the Department of Agriculture as an agricultural inspector. So prior to this, he worked on the family farm and had while he was in Dublin, then he continues to send money back to his father. So according to information in the file, James, at the time of his application, is aged between 70 and 80. So he informs the department that um, he had left the farm to another son, Michael, who died in March 1923. And Michael left a widow and six children between 18 months and seven years. Mm -hmm. And then another son dies in September 1923. So between May 1921 and September 1923, he's lost three sons. Mm -hmm. So as a result, he's living with his brother-in-law. James is living with his brother-in-law. So the Army Pensions Board found that as William had been a student and attending college, he was, and he wasn't working that he wasn't working on the family farm that the father could not be dependent on. Um, so here we have an extract from an internal memo. It states that the boy had left school and was awaiting an appointment, but I cannot see any dependency established. The case is the hard one, but in the terms of the act are definite, and I do not see any way out. So despite numerous representations from, from TDs and numerous appeals, there, are, there is no necessity of circumstances that's difficult. And therefore no dependency could be established and no award could therefore be made, which seems quite harsh mm -hmm. uh, considering what um, James Rear had gone through in the previous number of years. So the second story that deals with the bureaucracy um, is that of the Bennett family from Van Nagari, County Tipperary. Now Patrick Bennett was killed during an exchange with national forces at um, Bon Donald, Schlieffermann, County Tipperary. And this is an extract of the report from the Customs and Excise Officer in Thurles in 1934. So he's detailed the circumstances of the Bennett family. And it does make for some difficult reading. So Patrick, when he was killed, he was the eldest. And 
he was he was the eldest working child and he's the chief support. He was employed as a farm labourer <coughs> earning 19 pounds per annum, which in turn gave to his, his father. So the report reveals that John, the father, is employed as a farm labourer and was in receipt of nine shillings per week. He also had the use of the house, but he had no land to actually farm from, to work for himself. So following the death of his son, John is forced to give up the, his employment as he's a widower with 10 children, ranging in ages between 18 months and 21 years. A knock-on effect of him having to leave the employment is that he also has to give up uh, the house that they're living in. Oh yes, sir. Uh, so the report also reveals that the family circumstances changed drastically following the death of Patrick. The eldest daughters, Mary and Rose, who in 1923 are described as housekeepers and they're basically looking after the rest of the children. They left for England in order to find employment. As a result, John then was forced to place three of his children in the local industrial school in Cashel, where two of them died. So moreover, by 1934, none of his remaining children are in a position to assist him financially. And it's actually said that he was required to supply his married daughter, Nan, with vegetables and free milk. So you, it's easy to see then why the Custom and Excise Officer assessment of John Bennett rings true. So owing to the hardships endured since and subsequent bereavements, he has aged considerably with consequent impairment of his health. So given such circumstances, it can be difficult to see why John Bennett's application was rejected. The Army Pensions Board had recommended a gratuity of £112. However, his application was rejected on age grounds. So after numerous, numerous representations and appeals and queries, um, Bennett's application was reconsidered and he was deemed a special dependent under the Army Pensions Act 1937. So this entitled him to the sum of £26 per annum, which he was paid from <coughs> June 1937 until his death in, 1930, in 1944. So again, there are two cases, um, particularly difficult, difficult to understand the decisions. So the last story that I want to refer to refers to Mark Maloney. Martin was a private in the National Army and he is killed in September 1922 in Limerick. His mother, Bridget, made an application in 1924. It is revealed in the report from Godashi Akana that Bridget Maloney, husband, Martin, was drowned in the sinking of the SS Laurentic and another son, Michael Maloney, was killed in the First World War. For both her husband and Michael, she seemed to receive some form of compensation. The report reveals that there are still four, she still had four children between nine, sorry, between six and 19 years. However, there is a letter on file from the local parish priest, which um, makes for interesting reading. And it's quite difficult to read, so I'm just gonna read the extract. Father Glynn, writes, Mrs. Bridget Maloney is unfortunately a most degraded character, drunk, immorality, foulest mouth, and depraved. <laughs> I, heard, I had her interned in a forcible institute six years ago, and by misbehaving inside, she had to be put into a maternity home outside. <laughs> to give her any money, especially a lump sum, would be altogether undoing her. She has had from many sources tons, starves her children and foully abuses those who feed them. She is presently under a bail and if I can, she'll be interned for a term next court. So basically based off or in part off this letter, she's not given any award, she's not made an award. They did, there is a memo on file where Internally, they're asking, can they make an allowance to the children and sort of hold that in trust until they came of age, but that was rejected. They basically feel that they're, 
are they doing the, the better thing by not actually giving her any money? So finally then, just one or two points. The military service pensions collection is not a complete source. It should be used in conjunction with other sources. There's a number of reasons for this. Not all casualties left behind dependents to claim for them. Not all those entitled then actually lodge claims either. It was perhaps those with no financial need to make a claim or those who for idealistic idealistic or ideological reasons simply refuse to make a claim. So that concludes my talk. Um, you, there you have the contact details um, for the military service pension collection. If you have any questions, um, I'll let you take note of those. And if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Thank you. Yeah, the files are the files for the pensions collection are available online. So you just need to go on to sorry, I'll just go back to that. So you just need to go on to militaryarchives.ie, click on the pensions collection, and there you have the option to you can search by someone's name, search by address, um, and there's different combinations you can do. If you know the reference number, you can search by that. Um, but yeah, just going on to that, clicking on search collection, and that will get you sorted. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Is there a list of names that you can refer to, or do you have to input a name? Um, can you scan through a list yeah. that's been screened already? Well, for the releases from the pension series, we every time there's a release, we put out a list of names to go with it. So they're available in PDF format, so you can go on and search that. Uh, it's probably just easier to go into the actual database, as I mentioned already, and just type in the person's name. Um, and if the person doesn't turn up there, because as I said, we've only released 8,000, and there's 80,000 80, in there, the likelihood is it's not going to be, you know, at this stage, the likelihood is it's not going to be there. But if you go on then, if you have a look at the membership series, you know what area you're looking for, at least you will see the person might be able to identify what company you have um, and sometimes you'll also get reference numbers and stuff like that to go with it. You mentioned that in one case um, a mother being refused um, a pension because her son was illegitimate. Does that mean that, um, that the authorities at the time were keen on looking for reasons not to give pension, not to expend money and indeed did a detailed investigation to find out whether this son was illegitimate or not? Um, I wouldn't say they weren't in a hurry not to pay. They, once the Minister of Defence had signed off on an award being made, then the Department of Finance, while they could hold it up, they couldn't refuse to not, you know, to pay someone. In terms of like the illegitimacy example, there's plenty of. Um, how do I phrase this? When you see the marriage cert and you do the calculations, you would assume that, you know, like, so they don't go out of their way to, to exclude people because of that, no. Right, yeah. It sounds like that, uh, you know, the US investigation was so kind of detailed that mm. it was geared towards essentially keeping costs down rather than uh, sort of a, a humane outcome uh, because of the. Uh, service that was detailed and obviously her son uh, there was no question about it that he did take part mm. and uh, you know and uh, that if he had been legitimate everything would be fine exactly. but the fact that he was illegitimate was a kind of convenient reason not to pay out the money yeah well they do set out i didn't have it in the presentation but they do set out in the army pensions act they do set out all the different qualifications the criteria that someone had to meet so it had to be a mother father over a certain age brother and sister under certain ages, aunts, uncles, you know, were excluded, cousins were excluded, and legitimacy, I think, is one of those yeah. criteria as well. So there is all loads of different qualifying criteria, apart from the four sort of major one that I mentioned, there's qualifications on the other side as well for the families. Like, they do send, when they are conducting the investigations, they either send out to the custom excise officer or the local guard 
or in cases the parish priest to go out and they'll had a form to fill in with all the different information about what the person was earning, the different age of the other family. It seems that the interpretation was uh, fairly rigorous, you know, that a, a, you know, a convenient blind eye was turned to it on the basis that the young fellow like to uh, do his part on behalf of the, of the state and the mm-hmm. the freedom of the country and so on. Mm-hmm. And it seemed a bit, a bit, a bit of a harsh interpretation. Uh, somebody somewhere could have had it in their heart and said, oh, this is just, you know, throw a sheet over this and... You know. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you will see cases as well, which is one thing I have an issue with, that someone could die in the Civil War, have never been a member of, of the IRA. If you died, your, pa- your dependents could be made an award. Mm. However, if you lived and you applied for a pension, if you didn't have previous IRA service, you weren't going to get a pension. So right. there is that sort of... You could not be a member and die and get something, but you have been a member and, you know, like, so there is that sort of grey yeah. area of how they exactly, how exactly people qualify. Like, it is, in those cases, yes, I suppose by our standards now, how we would judge things, they would seem quite harsh. Yeah, it seems that uh, the rules are followed, but decency wasn't uh, abided by. It's, yes, yeah, to the letter of the, to the mm-hmm. rules, yeah. Would you reckon, Robert, that the finances of the state were in a very precarious position? Mm-hmm. Um, I know this outside you. Yeah. Know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, well, I'd imagine so at that early stage um, when they're making these awards in 1923, 24. Um, yeah, but it had to cost because they're still. I don't know if there's veterans still getting allowances or not, but up till recently there was still allowances being paid to widows. So like th- that cost, you know, that, that continues to go on. Um, as well as that, they it depended on the different legislation. They would give people, um, there was a free tele- you know, free TV, um, license, um, electricity. You know, like so those costs, those social costs, like always just climb and climb as the decades progress. But as to actual numbers, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any, any idea. Well, if I get into the uh, question of interpretation, yeah. you showed another slide there where it showed that there was a distinction drawn between 1922 and 32 between mm-hmm. officers and soldiers. Yeah. And then in 1932, with a federal government coming into power, uh, there was no distinction made. Now, um, that probably says one thing or another about, uh, about the politics of the time. But the very fact was that the officers seemed to get more in twice what a soldier was getting. And yet when Fianna Fáil took over in 1932, they seemed to go for a little figure between an officer and a soldier. Yeah. So again, cash seemed to be of, uh, of uh, significance again there. Uh, well, okay, in 1932, the uh, state economy was not very good at that mm. time. Yeah, I don't know how they actually, how they set the, the figures, but, um, yeah, I know I said twice, but it depended on which award has been made, but, um, yeah, how they actually come up with the figure of £112, 10 shilling. You know, like, it's a, hun- yeah. it's a odd, it seems to be an odd figure to pick, but, um, yeah. Yeah, right it's, exactly, yeah, it's just simply the distinction that was made, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and it seemed to be quite a, as you would have expected, an officer and a soldier, it might have been, uh, you know, two thirds of what an officer would get from maybe three quarters, and I mean, to have it more than double seems a bit uh, egregious, to be quite honest about it. Yeah, and you'd assume because when they're getting paid, they're getting paid more as well, you know, like, so it just seems to be, I won't say a class thing, but, you know, like, they're, they're making this real distinction in a rank, in terms of rank, what you would be given. Yeah, so I mean, let, let's be honest about it, in the 1920s, 1930s, it was class distinction, not two ways about it. So therefore, again, it's a matter of interpretation, again, by those who are uh, may, uh, making the rules and regulations. You know, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and I think it's, it, it does seem to point to a um, frame of mind that's just simply totally unaccepted in current circumstances. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Do, do we know the makeup of the board that made the decisions? Um, yes, I think in, it depends on which board. 
you know, there's there's an army pensions board, there's military service registration board, um, but they could have former um, commanding officers. In terms of then the more medical ones, they would have um, doctors would be on those boards. Um, but in terms of the actual army boards and the referees within the military service pensions guide we have done like a biography of the different board members uh, some of those were either yeah Garold Sullivan for example or former officers and then there's there's former judges and you know civil servants supporting civil servants so it depends on which on which board exactly but yeah Anyone else? Okay. Okay. So um, that was certainly enlightening in many respects, uh, I suppose. That, uh, from my uh, point of view, I think it showed uh, the degree of poverty in a lot of the country in, in those, through those years and um, must have taken a terrible toll on, on a lot of people uh, for to lose their, their support in the way that they did, um, financial support, etc. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank Robert very much for, for that.